Welcome to Cushman and Wakefield's Capital Markets webinar for Greater China with a spotlight on the dynamic city of Shanghai. I'm James Shepard, Head of Business Development Services for Cushman and Wakefield in Greater China and based in Shanghai. Now, we simply cannot kick off this webinar without recognizing the incredible Beijing Winter Olympics with Chinese athletes already boasting an impressive five gold, three silver and two bronze medals. We've also seen an impressive showing for many co other countries in Asia Pacific, including medals for Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand. A fantastic result so far. Pivoting to discuss real estate and the ongoing development of China is not difficult from here as we see the Winter Olympics driven by stated themes of sustainability, and it has also helped drive advancements in infrastructure and city development in China. Looking to the economic situation, we've seen a high degree of volatility in macroeconomic indicators. Despite this and the prevailing supply chain disruption, ongoing developer debt issues, challenges on co combating COVID and the resulting restrictions impacting the economy, we are still experiencing some reasonable but somewhat fragile economic growth in mainland China. While the rest of the world seems to be engaging in policy tightening in the face of rampant inflation, China has managed to maintain lower levels of inflation as has been increasingly indicating a softening stance with enhanced policy support. Hopefully, we are now shifting gear, leaving behind a spike in tightening of regulations last year that targeted sectors such as internet technology, education, real estate and other industries. In fact, many economists are now starting to opine that looking ahead, we will see more relaxed policy stance and a focus on defending a growth rate of around 5%. Some recent indications of this are that China's central bank further trimmed the reserve ratio requirement in December, the second such move last year. In the December adjustment frees up something in the order of 1.2 trillion renminbi in liquidity, which may also help to push interest rates moderately lower and will support state-backed infrastructure development and mortgage lending, which in turn will alleviate some pressure on China's developers. Meanwhile, net zero targets by 2060 may create some challenges, but are also creating some interesting opportunities in the real estate sector. In Hong Kong, our thoughts go out to our friends and colleagues as COVID has caused yet more disruption. Roll on the Financial Secretary's 2022-23 budget speech due on 23rd February, where hopefully we will see additional support to Hong Kong's economy as it navigates this late, latest COVID setback. Despite this challenging situation, we do note positive trends and some resilience over the past year for Hong Kong. Let me tell you about the excellent speakers that we've lined up for you on today's panel. I'm delighted that today we have Francis Lee and Gordon Marsden join us to share their views. Wayne Chang will also give us an update on Shanghai's increasingly attractive investment landscape, and Catherine Chen will host our panel discussion. As many of you will know, Francis is a prominent expert on China investment who has maintained hands on experience in Hong Kong, mainland China and Taiwan for over 37 years. Francis has successfully closed a huge number of high profile transactions over his career. Under the leadership of Francis in 2021 alone, Cushman Wakefield's Greater China Capital Markets team completed 30 major transactions with a total consideration of around 35 billion renminbi or approximately 5.5 billion US dollars. Gordon sits in our Asia Pacific Capital Markets platform and for the last 14 years has been based in Hong Kong. Today, he's joining us from Singapore, having temporarily escaped the tightening of COVID restrictions in Hong Kong. He primarily works with global, regional and cross-border investors and supports our teams on major divestment mandates across the region. Wayne serves as executive director for Cushman and Wakefield's capital market team in East China with 15 years of experience, culminating in a total transaction value of nearly 30 billion renminbi across 20 transactions and having helped institutional investors such as Warburg Pincus, Morgan Stanley, the Carl Lyle Group and the Lu Zetsui Group. Prior to joining Cushman and Wakefield, Weld, Wayne held the position of executive director with Kailong Group, responsible for portfolio management of the firm's Greater China Real Estate Core Fund. 
Moderating today's panel discussion is Catherine Chen. With over a decade spent working with Cushman and Wakefield, Catherine is our subject matter expert for capital markets research in Asia Pacific. Prior to this, Catherine has led and worked on many research and advisory projects for multinational investors and developers. She has also spent time working in North America, Shanghai, and is now based in Hong Kong. With that, let me run through a quick update on the greater China market overall before I hand over to Wayne for our spotlight session on Shanghai. So last year's hot topic was, of course, developer debt and the three red lines. And though we're still experiencing ongoing challenges as developers restructure to live with lower levels of gearing, there now appears to be some light at the end of the tunnel for many. But the challenges of the last year or so, since the government reinforced the importance of meeting the three red lines, will have some longer term implications. Right now, it's all about the cash flow. On this slide, we can see three charts which give us some visibility on prevailing trends in the development of residential in light blue, retail in grey and office property in dark blue. The first chart on the left represents the short term where we can see in light blue residential construction floor area maintained positive growth through 2020 and 2021. Not surprising as for developers, this sector typically has more likelihood of generating more immediate cash flow than in the retail and office sectors due to strata titled off plan residential sales. These attractive residential cash flow dynamics have been enhanced yet further given the recent concessions made on residential mortgage lending and the use of funds in escrow. Following the initial COVID outbreak, commercial sectors took longer to return to positive growth. For all sectors, this positive growth momentum suggests that in the immediate future, there will be a modest pickup in supply versus the delivery seen last year. Moving to the chart in the middle, we can see that following a pronounced spike in the new development investment in last February, it has now moved back into negative territory for commercial sectors and is also trending in that direction for the residential sector. This is likely due to the current debt and cash flow challenges. Over the midterm, this suggests supply pipelines will again soften, particularly for commercial property types. On the right, we can see new starts firmly in negative territory for all sectors, as developers focus any liquidity on finishing off projects and getting these to market. With negative growth of more than 20% for commercial sectors, this suggests that mid to longer term, we'll see less supply than in recent years, particularly in the office sector, which has been down by around 20% for a sustained period since May last year. According to the developer's schedules provided to us, over 10 million square meters of supplies planned in 2022. However, when we look back over the last two years, we see that construction delays and sales of completed projects to owner occupiers has meant that only 30 to 36% of this has made it to the leasing market. Bearing in mind the three charts we discussed on the previous page and looking ahead, this year, it's unlikely we will see any more than half of this enter the leasing market. Judging from the data on new development investment and new starts, and assuming a typical construction schedule of approximately three years, a similar lower supply scenario will likely play out over the next two to four years. It's now very unlikely we will see the lofty supply levels of the period 2006 to 2008. Net absorption of quality office premises in Greater China markets in 2021 was an annual record of 5.3 million square meters. On the demand front, we picked in Q2, peaked in Q2 2021 with a record 1.7 million square meters net absorption across all markets as pent up demand was unleashed to the market. It's also no coincidence that this latest peak fell almost exactly three years after the prior peak, given the typical three year lease cycle in China. In Q3, this moderated to a still robust 1.2 million square meters. And by Q4, this was down again to just over 800,000 square meters of office space with demand waiting increasingly to first tier markets. In Q1 2022, we will, will likely be soft given that pent up demand will largely now have been satisfied, coupled with 
the seasonal impact of New Year, followed closely by the Chinese New Year holiday. Hong Kong in dark blue managed to squeeze out another consecutive quarter of positive net absorption just before we entered another tough COVID induced lockdown scenario. This impressive ramp up in leasing activity, which commenced a year and a half ago and ran through 2021, pushed the greater China office market back into a commanding position in terms of leasing activity regionally. Strong absorption at a time where local real estate liquidity is tight have historically been attra highly attractive factors of the China market from an international investor perspective, especially where these two factors coincide. Over the last four years, except for 2019, Greater China markets have commanded the lion's share of Asia Pacific leasing activity. Even with some further softening of leasing activity in 2022, as any lingering pent up demand is satisfied, modest expansion of existing office occupiers on the back of the likely moderation of supply will likely lead to a healthier office market environment from an investor standpoint. But looking further ahead, Given the short lease terms of in China of typically three years, as I mentioned earlier, we should be on the lookout for another boom in activity in two to three years time as leases signed during the boom period of the last one and a half years come up for expiry. Generally, the suppressed levels of supply and strong absorption have led to declining vacancy in most markets, and this is particularly pronounced for Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen and second tier markets in recent quarters. On the left, we note that Shenzhen, Shanghai, Taipei and Tier 2 cities are now experiencing tighter vacancy than pre-COVID. However, on the right hand side, we can see that Beijing, Hong Kong, Guangzhou still see vacancy above pre-pandemic levels marked with the dotted red line. As the improvement in occupancy across markets started to be felt by landlords, rentals appeared to start bottoming out or even saw some modest increases. Since the pandemic took hold, we can see on the left that Guangzhou, Shanghai, Taipei and second tier markets demonstrated reasonable rental resilience. Conversely, on the right, the more expensive markets of Hong Kong and Beijing saw a much steeper contraction in rent. Shenzhen also saw significant softening during this period. However, it should be noted that all markets featured, uh, of all the markets featured, Beijing seems to be bouncing back on the back of strong absorption with rentals increasing through the second half of 2021. The same is also true of many sub-districts of other cities where supply and demand dynamics are greatly improved at a local level. On the left, across Greater China, transactions in 2021 totaled 380 billion RMB approximately 40% above the 2020 volume. Despite the challenging situation in Hong Kong, we did see the return to positive leasing absorption of the last six months, and the 2021 commercial real estate investment volume on the left-hand chart demonstrates that in dark gray, the Hong, that Hong Kong saw the third strongest investment volume on record. Impressively, this was the second strongest city performance across greater China after Shanghai for 2021. Nevertheless, with the latest COVID flare up and restrictions, recovery is no doubt once again getting kicked further down the road for now, but it does beg the question, is pent up demand continuing to build? Is a window of opportunity open now for Hong Kong investment as investors look to a 2023 rebound? Hopefully Gordon can share some views on this later in the panel discussion. Looking to the midterm, some mainland Chinese developers are resolving many of their debt issues. For those successfully restructuring, evolving to live with the lower leverage, Hong Kong will most likely be back on radar at some point. Mainland Chinese owner occupier acquisitions in Hong Kong will also likely see some significant growth over the mid to long term. On the right, we can see that in the mainland market, despite ongoing travel restrictions and some significant foreign investor led deals falling over, inbound investment managed to command an impressive 28% share of this, which I hope we can digest further in the panel discussion. On the left hand side, no big change in terms of investment by destination, though Shanghai did take a slightly larger 40% share than the 35% share seen in 2020. More from Wayne on this later. Sector wise on the right, office and R&D remain the prefer, preferred asset category, 
albeit the share was lower than 2020. Retail jumped from an 11% share to a 20% share. The strong rebound in retail investment was led by a few large portfolio deals such as Brookfield's acquisition of the Mosaic and Ping An's purchase of Raffles City shopping centres. In addition, we saw several service apartment deals transact such as Somerset Shu Hui in Shanghai and Fraser Suites in CBD Beijing. These transactions also supported a concentration of investment in Shanghai and Beijing markets. So with that, I'd like to pass you over to Wayne to look at the Shanghai market in a bit more depth. Hi everyone, I'm Wayne Chain from Shanghai Capital Markets. Uh, I will take a few minutes to discuss Shanghai's investment market. Uh, first of all, there are five takeaways uh, for 21-21. Uh, number one is Shanghai transaction volume uh, topped China's number one uh, in 2021. Uh, China saw RMB 256 billion uh, RMB of transactions, and 40 of that actually came from Shanghai, uh, and that exceeded Beijing's 24% of the China market share at 63.6 billion. Second of all, we saw a very strong office demand in Shanghai. A total of 142 square meters of office space uh, was absorbed last year. This brought the vacancy rate from 2020's 22% to around 16%. And also, uh, we see uh, some rent changes. In 20, third of all, in 2021, the owner occupiers buying spree remained strong. And noticeably, we saw more buyers from TMT and biopharmaceutical companies buying assets. Number fourth, and which is probably the most important to investors, is that we see cap rates across all property types increased. Uh, there has been a, a, a few investment transactions, uh, more noticeably in BP, uh, some in CBD office, some in uh, DBD, what we call decentralized non-core offices and retail transactions. I will elaborate on the details later. And last but not least, um, even with uh, domestic buyers still account for 76% of the total market share, we actually saw more investors coming in to Shanghai, whether they're uh, domestic investors or inbound investors buying properties in Shanghai. And that's quite encouraging. Next slide, please. So in 2021, uh, we saw the transaction volume in Shanghai topped 100 6 billion RMB. That's actually after five years of decline since 2016, the first time we broke 100 billion mark in Shanghai for total transaction. That actually came back to the same level of 2018. Uh, that is a really encouraging fact that we are seeing. And we gather all our transactions uh, data from various platforms and through our brokers. So we're quite confident about this 106 billion RMB transaction. And we actually feel uh, this is an upward trend, not only from 2020 to 2021, but coming to 2022, we actually feel there will be more investment transactions. Or even earlier this year, there's only been a, a month and a half in 2022, we've seen some major transactions, such as Morgan Stanley selling off their Zhangjiang Center in Zhangjiang, uh, such as Heisen buying up Wampoa's City Link in Jing'an. So we are seeing more and more investors coming back to the market, uh, and and we foresee and we hope, actually knock on wood, that this year uh, will also be another 100 billion plus years. Next. So in Shanghai 2021, uh, we saw record-breaking absorption for office space. Total 1.42 million square meters of office space was taken. And this caused the vacancy rate to drop from 2020's 22% to 2021's 16%. Some examples such as Amazon taking up 9,900 square meters of space in Qiantan, Huawei taking up 10,000 square meters of Raffle City North Bun, or even Billy Billy taking up 11,000 square meters of space in Yangpu. So this really shows a strong surge of office demand in 2021. Uh, 
how, how has rent reacted during this time? A slight surge from 2020's 8.1 to 2021's 8.2 renminbi per square meter per day. And uh, what, do we foresee uh, further spaces being taken up? I've actually uh, spoken to lots of our, our OSG or tenant rep representatives. Um, they feel that the 2021 1.42 million square meters of, of take up was actually caused by much of the pent up demand in 2020 because of COVID. Uh, coming to 2022, uh, seeing uh, the tenants activity so far, they think uh, there might not be as much uh, absorption this year, but the, the demand will still be strong, but just not as much as 1.42 million this year. Okay, next please. And moving on, uh, in 2021, we saw the owner occupier buying spree remain strong. Uh, noticeably from the left corner, the TMT sector, uh, TMT sector transaction volume increased nearly ninefold from renminbi 1.8 billion in 2020 to 17.4 billion. That's attributable to COVID. Even China, we are quite free to have our daily lives back together. Uh, the rest of the world still pretty much locked up uh, uh, or, or, or are still affected by COVID. And with that, much of the TMP companies, whether they're doing online business uh, or doing uh, uh, any uh, online related uh, businesses, are th business are thriving. Biopharmaceutical bio sectors too, we saw transaction double from RMB 2.2 billion to 4.4. Again, after COVID, more tests uh, or, or pharmaceutical research are required. People are more well uh, uh, health concerned. So we see further growth in biopharmaceutical company as well. Uh, what's noticeably uh, uh, different from years before uh, is the finance sector. Uh, the market share for finance uh, owner occupier buying uh, went down from 56% to 16%. We attribute that to two facts. Perhaps um, in 2020 or 2019, we saw a lot of transactions in uh, Greenland's property uh, by the bonds. Shanghai Bank, Haitong Securities, other financial institutions are buying uh, properties along the bond. Uh, but even but coming to 2021, the major buyers are not the financial institutions. Um, they're they're like they're the TMT and the biopharmaceutical bio companies, uh, as I said earlier. These are the buy, main buyers. Uh, consumer goods, uh, traditional uh, manufacturing companies, trading companies. Yes, they are they are buying assets. One thing I like to point out is the government. You see, the government or SOE companies uh, they took eight percent of the market share in 2021. That's actually quite an interesting fact. Uh, we're seeing government from Li Sui Zhengfu or Sun Guo Tou or uh, company, uh, government in the uh, um, uh, also look, working on the investment side of things, buying them assets. So we should note that these SOE companies uh, coming into the market represent a potential exit for investors. Um, a good example is uh, Bering. They, three years ago, they acquired a property, a BP property in Hongqiao Lin Kong, and recently they sold their assets to a Changning government related buyer. So when the market is looking for potential exits, a great example is what's happening recently uh, with Shanghai Shimao selling off their prime core People Square assets to Jiu Shi, which is another SOE ent entity. So we're seeing that trend, and I suspect this 8% uh, government or SOE market share may further increase in 2022. Next, please. Now, this is the cap rate trend that many investors are the most interested in. Um, with uh, our 100 or so transacted data, we separate from the investors and the owner occupiers. So the 
the lines and charts that you're seeing here are all from investment activities. First of all, the green, the red line is the gray A office buildings. These, these are the gray office building in the core areas, the like of uh, People Square, the like of Xin Tian Di or Nanjing West Row or Lu Jia Zui. We saw a cap rate increase uh, from 2020 to 2021 and reaching at 4.4% cap rate. It's actually not, hasn't been many any investment activities on offices in Shanghai. Uh, one more noticeable is uh, Zhongjin Dasha. Okay, this building is on Xu Jiahui, uh, above on the metro line. It was uh, purchased by a shoe manufacturing company as an investment. And the property was con uh, was transacted at 4.4% cap rate. And for non-core areas, the dark blue line, you see the, the cap rate for CBD office is inching closer to the non-core gray A cap rates. And that's really because what was once very active, a very active market in non-core areas where back in 2016, 2017, investors are buying up properties in Hong Kong, North Bund, uh, train station or Changfeng Park, that investment activities has slowed down. Instead, uh, they're buyers in their end user buyers buying properties in the decentralized or non-core area. There hasn't been much uh, transactions in the non-core area. That's why this cap rate kind of is staying flat. OK, doesn't mean it won't go up because if you look at the light blue line, which is the business park uh, transactions cap rate, we see 4.9% of uh, uh, cap rate. In 2021, there's been a few noticeable BP properties transacted. One is AEW selling up their really beautiful enough tower in Taojin. They sold that asset to Suzhou Yuanlian, which you know there is a is a SOE invested fund. Okay, that property was transacted at 4.7 to 4.8 percent cap rates. Uh, Kailong, they also bought a business park in Jinxiao from World Union. And and that they buy that property for the intention of uh, making it turn it into a research facility, and that property is is transacted at around 4.9 to 5 percent cap rate. So what we're seeing is that the CBD cap rates going up is also raising investors' expectation for BP cap rates to go up, which also is leading and, and, and bringing up the retail cap rates. You see the four retail cap rates in 2021 reached 2.1, uh, sorry, 4.3 percent. And we, we actually foresee um, cap rates to go up uh, slightly further. Um, Jamie had just said earlier, uh, we see developers uh, going to bankruptcy. We see developers selling their very prime assets uh, at a discount. That was not seen before in previous years. It, developers were still holding out, but right now we are seeing more transactions from distressed uh, de developers. We're seeing more properties from court auctions. So we're actually seeing we're, we're actually seeing this uh, cap rate to go uh, foresee. We actually foresee the cap rate to go further up. OK, and Next slide, please. In 2021, uh, we saw more uh, more investors uh, coming in to China to buy, and we call them inbound or uh, foreign or inbound investors uh, from 16% to 24%. Uh, I can there been a few noticeable transactions from foreign investors or inbound investors. We started the year 2021 with uh, GIC uh, selling their Chiba Wanke retail mall to Link Reads. Allianz buying a BP from Dongzhou in Zhangjiang. And the like of Blackstone and LaSalle Investments are also were very active buying up service apartments in uh, Shanghai. So we're we're happy to see inbound investors 
uh, becoming more confident to invest back in Shanghai. Remember 2020, uh, Beijing actually saw more transaction volume from foreign investors uh, investing in Beijing than in Shanghai. And we're happy to see that Shanghai took the crown again uh, last year. Uh, and, you know, we, we understand this fact because back in 2020, when COVID was still uh, uh, rampaging, investors really couldn't come to Shanghai. But now we're happy to see many of the out, or inbound investors, they're willing to travel to Shanghai, go through the three weeks quarantine, just so that they can look at more assets, look at more properties and spend their money here. We're really happy to see that. Okay, next slide, please. So, in 2021, we saw more investors activities, as I as said before, uh, more 63% versus 2020 is 47%. Uh, the owner occupier uh, went down, uh, market share went down from 53% to 37%, uh, but that that is still a large number of owner occupiers buying, okay? Because in 2021, we saw more than 100 billion RMB of transactions. Uh, but investors, we believe, and we're seeing more, uh, should continue strong in 2022. Next slide, please. So this, what are the investors buying? Uh, what are the properties being transacted? In 2020, we saw 80% of the offices, uh, and R&D office and R&D offices being transacted, but that, really shrunk to 46.7%. Uh, office transactions used to uh, account for 80% of the market share, market total market transaction, but because of the large supply of Shanghai office, this past 2021, we saw 1.2 million square meters of office space, and 2022, 2023, we are going to see similar level of office space supply as well and that's affecting investors confidence in buying up offices and successfully leasing them so we see less investors uh, uh, fewer investors going to uh, office buildings unless they can buy at a good bargain instead we see more and more offices uh, more and more r d offices being transacted and brokers we actually we vote not with our hands but with our feet and you can see where we visit where our inspections has been. So we actually lately in the last three to six months, most of our uh, inspections or investors are in Zhangjiang, in Jinchao, in Chaojin, or even the expansion areas of Zhangjiang like Zopu, Kangqiao, where people are looking for life science offices, life science spaces. So uh, that's the trend that we're seeing. Uh, also mixed use, uh, percentage went from 8% to 20%. Uh, one major transaction in that is uh, Ping An Trust buying from uh, Capital Land with Capital Land's two major assets in Shanghai, Raffle City People's Square and Raffle City Zhongshan Park. Uh, retail investors such as uh, Brookfield bought from Macquarie a five asset portfolio in China and one of them uh, Mosaic is in Shanghai on Nanjing East Road. So more and more investors are buying retail as well. Some newer economy assets such as data center, there was zero, uh, zero um, data center that we tracked that was transacted in 2020, in 2020 but versus 9% uh, of that in 2021. It's a difficult sector to get in. Uh, much of investors uh, uh, there's first of all, there's not a lot of supply or stocks available to buy, and it, it's actually uh, quite te technical for investors to look at this new sector. One very interesting fact that we're seeing is apartments. Uh, like I said earlier, investors such as Blackstone, LaSalle Investments have all purchased uh, apartment uh, for uh, their investment, and new players such as Brookfield are also coming in. Over Pincus has many apartment or long-term stay apartment uh, invest, invest, investments that they have made. So apartments actually also another very strong sector that investors are buying right now. 
industrial, of course, logistics, everyone's going after it. We had just helped the uh, DLJ divest their logistics portfolio, uh, and that went through six rounds of bidding. So we know this is a hard sector. However, uh, much of the transactions uh, for logistics assets is all across China, not just strictly in Shanghai alone. And lastly, uh, less investment uh, transaction in hotels, uh, perhaps due to uh, COVID. Uh, some of the hotels that I personally was helping in sell to divest uh, have been taken over by the government to use as quarantine hotels. So uh, hotel sector, we've seen less investments. Next, please. So these are the uh, transaction uh, cases or typical uh, transaction cases that uh, happened last year. Uh, as I was said, I, as I said earlier, CICC, that's the Zhongjin uh, International Plaza was purchased by Bai Li Xie Ye in Xu Jiahui. Uh, Capital Land selling Raffle City, Shanghai, Cap Raffle City, Changning. Uh, 200, uh, it's a, it's a 20, Billion, twenty billion RMB transaction uh, that they sold to Ping An Life Insurance. Uh, Mosaic, I said earlier, Brookfield uh, buying that uh, from Macquarie. And you know, one thing I also like to point out is just being a lot of R and D office specifically for life science uses. Uh, now that investors are interested right now, uh, a very well known Hong Kong based uh, PRE fund. Uh, purchased a Zhangjiang Life Science property last year. And more and more investors are going to Zhopu and Kangchao to look at these assets. Last but not least, Data Center uh, in Minghang, uh, Capital Land also purchased a uh, big data center, 14,000 uh, cabinets uh, last year. Next, please. I'll look for 2022. Um, as Jamie has said earlier, uh, tighten credit and liquidity for property developers. It's bringing more quality assets to the market. Uh, in addition to helping, in addition to that, Shi um, uh, selling their assets to Jiu Shi or, or or Shanghai Shanghai Di Chan. Uh, we are also helping uh, Jia Zhao Ye to divest their property in Lu Jiazui, office property in Lu Jiazui. What these property used to be uh, uh, developers' core assets, which they would never consider selling, now they are almost forced to sell. And actually, uh, last couple of months, many of our brokers, investment brokers in Shanghai, they spent their time right. looking over core auction assets. I myself have participated in two, and we're seeing that as a trend to going forward. Investors' interest for pre-distressed pre assets have increased and are going to increase more because, because they are really trying to find the bargain or the, the price that they pay for these assets is worth the effort going in, okay? Clean and to, to is worth the offer going, and so we're seeing that more and more. Second, market share of new economy sectors such as logistics, uh, industrial product uh, projects such as data center and self storage will continue to grow. That's uh, what that was already the trend for 2020, coming into 2021, and go still going strong in 2022. Shanghai continue to build a one plus five plus X. Biopharmaceutical sector. The one is Zhangjiang, and that is referring to the Greater Zhangjiang. Um, there's been few successful uh, life science cases in Zhangjiang. Ben Morgan Stanley buying up Mayen, uh, Starcrest successfully divested their uh, life science property in Zhangjiang, and of course uh, buying more in Zhangjiang as well. The five is referring to the new uh, uh, development that the government is pushing forward to. The like of Fengxian, Jinshan, Baoshan, and Minghang, etc. So that is where the government is pushing these life science or biopharmaceutical companies to go move towards to. And last but not least, uh, long-term rental apartments are attracting increased investors' attention. I had said earlier, uh, Brookfield, Blackstone, LaSalle Investment, Warburg Pincus has been in for a long time. 
more investors are coming into the long term rental apartments uh, as their investment strategy. So that concludes my uh, sector for the Shanghai investment market. I'll hand it over to Catherine. Thank you, Wang, for sharing your insights on Shanghai investment market. And now it's our panel discussion time. Uh, please feel free to leave your question in the Q&A box and we will try to answer them in the time allowed. Um, so the first question I want to ask Francis. So what, uh, what, one of the biggest news in the last year was tightening of real estate lending, including the three red lines as mentioned by Jamie earlier, have you seen any significant impact of this in China's commercial real estate market? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I think as Wayne said clearly that uh, purely uh, some of those core assets hold by the local developers, they are very core, uh, not available for sale. But due to the recent uh, credit crunch or squeeze of liquidity, uh, these local developers, they can't hold on. Um, these solution for them is to sell down these core assets in the city, no matter it's uh, office, no matter it's a uh, retail, uh, small or even kind of uh, uh, five star hotels. I think they all are available, become available now. And also in terms of pricing, I think uh, uh, they are becoming a more willing seller with a price indication um, more marked to the market than previously. They always mark up uh, these core asset by 20, 25 percent, which is uh, uh, with the increase of the cap rate. I think uh, no int uh, in in investor is, is uh, willing to pay that sort of price. But uh, in the past few months, I did we did see a lot of uh, transaction been done, uh, reported, and then uh, hopefully I think, I think uh, in 2022, especially the first half of this year, uh, we will see more this kind of uh, willing willing seller, willing buyer coming to the market to uh, match it with these uh, sizable deals. Thank you, Francis. Uh, the next question I, I'd like to ask Gordon. So we've often heard investors saying new economy is now becoming the hardest investment target. How about on the supply side? Do you see enough tradable stock to meet the growing gr growing demand? Thank you, Catherine. Um, so just on is new economy assets the sort of hottest investment target? Um, I'd agree with that. Um, obviously, there is a definition issue. So there is new economy assets like logistics and data centers that Wayne has just mentioned, but there's also the opportunity to pursue new economy tenants um, and they well may well be occupying office assets uh, and as we saw you know office is you know still by far and away the dominant sector in sort of uh, Asia Pacific um, it might not have seen in China the same sort of growth uh, that the logistics sector has uh, seen um, but you know investment volumes in the office side have been sustained but if you look at, I guess, that first new economy asset, which was, well, potentially still is sort of logistics, we've got phenomenal sort of development volumes taking place in Asia Pacific, which would suggest that, you know, the supply is trying to catch up with the demand. Um, and at one level, that's absolutely true. Um, there is uh, sustained demand um, for uh, new product. Um, it's a bit more nuanced because we're also sort of seeing in many parts of the region that actually rents are flatlined or certainly not sort of uh, growing at, at a pace that you would automatically think. Um, so I think you can certainly underwrite sort of the demand drivers, but how much kind of rental growth uh, you assume uh, is a bit more nuanced and challenging. Um, most of the new economy sort of participation I would say is sort of happening via sort of clubs, JVs and partnerships. And I've just written about that on our Capital Markets Hub page. Um, and then there's also some barriers. That I guess are still um, limiting the explosion of participation um, and constrained supply in the new economy. And, and probably the, the biggest today, um, in my opinion, is around sort of energy and power. 
um, you know, be that as a constraint to data center development or indeed as the sort of the cold chain logistics uh, sort of market evolves uh, in China. Um, so I'll leave it there, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. So I, I want to ask Wayne, how about Shanghai? What strategies are you seeing investors are now taking to increase their allocation of new economy sectors? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, New economy investment uh, investors have been very active in this sector. What I can say, the new strategy is just to pound more money, be more aggressive, put more capital about money in, especially on the logistics sector. Uh, earlier this year, we helped DOJ transacted uh, their portfolio, and we were actually quite uh, stunned to see how active investors are coming to buy these assets. Of course, these are good assets in Shanghai or Greater Shanghai area. They're nice logistics assets, but just the sheer uh, aggressiveness and resulting in you know, what well, the kind of cap rate that has been traded. That portfolio was traded under 4.5% cap rate. And is, as you recall, I said earlier, Shanghai CBD office were traded at 4.4% and DBD at 4.5%. To have a logistic portfolio traded below 4.5 or near uh, the, the CBD office cap rate line, that's quite phenomenal to us. So uh, I think investors are just being uh, quite active in this market. Uh, another, another thing is investors are also, in addition, because, but there's also only a limited number of logistic assets for investors to buy, right? Uh, investors are also being uh, active in other sites other type of new economy assets such as, such as self storage that's also another very active market right now i personally would help a investor buy a self storage asset two years ago last year so that's another sector that's also new economy which the, comp the government is pushing on as well uh, data center too uh, is not being much stock at all and you really not just the guanxi you need the energy certificates the government to help you out uh, building the, the the electrical lines and whatnot. It's not an easy sector to get in, and investors are new in this, uh, are learn are new to this sector. They're learning about this sector. They were looking for JV partners to buy in data center and whatnot. Uh, but I I would say uh, the new economy is attracting lots of attention from investors. And Cushman coming from the brokerage end, of course, uh, we're also working really hard to find assets in this regard as well. I see. Thank you, Wayne. Um, so, Francis, I I wonder how about the uh, the traditional office and retail properties, as we saw previously, that they still account for a majority share of the total uh, uh, transaction volume last year. But at the same time, they are often seen as less favored by investor in comparison with the new economy. Uh, what's your thought on this? Uh, yes, Kathleen. Uh, office sector always remained. Uh, a very important part of a portfolio for the uh, institutional investor and global investors. So the, although we come down in terms of the proportion, but they still account for a very major uh, portion of the of, of, of their uh, holdings. I think uh, uh, Shanghai and especially China as a whole, I think had gone through a cycle of uh, high supply of office space, uh, demand coming down, as, uh, and as uh, we, uh, Jamie has showed right, in Shanghai last year, I think uh, especially the second half of last year, I think we have a very substantial take up of uh, pent up office demand. So the, with the, uh, the uh, uh, economic activity coming back after the, the COVID uh, inference, I think uh, investor will be coming back to this uh, uh, important office uh, investment market. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, investment return uh, move up, such as cap rate, but that means the uh, price had come down. So I think uh, investor will be interested to to uh, pick office investment at the return of uh, say 4.5 level, and uh, we expect uh, more and more uh, uh, investor will be coming back to this uh, very important uh, sector in the market. Uh, kind of, uh, I would say, kind of. Uh, uh, I, I will not say it is a bottom fishing, but uh, it's a good buy especially coupled with the fact that a lot of investor fund manager have raised a, a large amount of capital 
globally. So the where they can invest. Uh, after all, uh, office sector is still a very, very important asset class in the investment portfolio. I see. Thank you, Francis. So, so uh, Borden, where do you see opportunities in office and or retail um, in Hong Kong, perhaps um, at the moment, if there's any? Oh, of course there are, Catherine. There are opportunities. Um, but I, you know, just come back and reiterate the point that was made by Jamie in his presentation and, and made by Francis around this phenomenal net absorption in the office sector that is taking place. Um, so, you know, Jamie put up 5.3 million square meters of space taken up in 2021. You know, even if we sort of see what Wayne um, is hearing from our colleagues around, you know, OK, um, you know, the demand might not be quite as high as sort of 2021, which was a, you know, a bounce back kind of year. Um, you know, we're still talking about phenomenal numbers um, at an Asia Pacific level as a whole. It's eight million square meters. Um, you know, that compares to a peak back in sort of 2018 at, at sort of 10.3 million. So, you know, it, it, there is still absolutely a story whether or not we're talking about Hong Kong, GBA or Greater China as a whole around playing to that um, office story. So more specifically, um, I believe the employment situation, uh, rapid recovery, it's down to 5.2 percent unemployment in November. Um, which is a complete recovery given it was at that level in December 2019. Um, obviously, it's the business and services employment that's driving the office absorption, and that's obviously forecast to see sustained levels of growth over the next four years. Um, aside from Shanghai, according to um, forecasts at the end of last year, um, the highest employment growth in that business and financial services sectors is expected in Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou and Chengdu. So six sort of dynamic cities uh, that are also going to be amongst the top 10 in sort of Asia Pacific. So, you know, the messaging is to uh, to investors is to to play to that story. Uh, back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. So looking into 2020, uh, 2022, for instance, uh, what do you think the China market, um, including Hong Kong, will be like in comparison with 2021? I mean, definitely, I think in terms of uh, market transaction volume, transaction activity will be going up. As Vane say that uh, investors are willing to spend the uh, quarantine period and then take a trip into China to inspect the property, get some deal done which uh, I think uh, in 2020, most of them are still, oh, I better stay at home. And then I, I have to rely on the uh, brokers and also my local team to get it done. So the, I would expect in terms of uh, transaction more, let me go up and then the, will be kind of uh, in the background of, uh, as I said earlier, that most of these uh, big investors, they have raised a lot of money. So the, with the growing uh, economic development in China, and also the opportunity of this uh, uh, credit squeeze. Uh, some of those uh, local developer investors, they can't hold on. I think it's a perfect timing for them to come in to pick up some of those uh, better quality, more central, more core location assets, which is not available previously in the market. Thank you, Back Francis. You. Uh, yeah, thank you, Francis. Uh, so. Looking at the time right now, or perhaps I will ask one last question to Gordon. So looking at the Asia Pacific market as a whole, what do you think China's competitiveness um, uh, is versus the other Asian markets? Uh, it still remains very good. I mean, if you consider, um, you know, the Hang Seng is up 5% year to date. It's flat with where it was five years ago. The Shanghai Composite is 5% down year to date up seven and a half on the sort of the past five years, you know, an indication that we've probably seen the bottom, but we're not yet kind of really sort of seeing, you know, the the, the recovery. If you kind of look at, you know, what is happening in the broader um, stock markets uh, in, in China. Um, so in, uh, and what is it? You know, it's China's economic resilience um, and it's its sound supply chain sort of foundations, you know, during the the pandemic. Um, you know, that has 
ultimately kind of won the confidence of of many market participants, many investors, uh, and I think that that is um, you know the the foundation of confidence uh, going forward. Um, and as the investment volumes have spoken to, uh, and you can't ignore the absorption, whether or not it's that business and finance uh, uh, absorption, or whether or not it's the demand for uh, logistics and and coal chain space. So you know, I think there is lots of reasons to be optimistic uh, and have a lot of confidence um, for ongoing participation and therefore competitiveness uh, against other geographies in Asia Pacific. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor to you, Jamie, for the final closing. Thank you very much, Catherine. And, and uh, just to summarise, so we heard from Francis, liquidity issues causing more quality assets to come to market and pricing is looking a bit more attractive than in the past. Uh, traditional office still remains critical to international investors uh, but for their portfolios and we'll see some resurgence as the pricing becomes uh, increasingly attractive. Wayne pointed out that in Shanghai we continue to see owner occupiers activity, particularly from TMT and also the biopharmaceutical sector and ramping up of inbound investment into the Shanghai market. He's expecting 2022 acquisitions uh, looking very positive and who could see a ramp up. New potential exit avenues are opening up, such as to government linked en entities, and cap rates are increasingly becoming more attractive and forecasts further increases. Gordon's insight was excellent, and uh, he uh, commented a bit about the new economy investment, pointed out that it's not just about the assets, but also really need to look at the tenant profile in office assets, for example. And participation in this sector uh, is really being limited by a number of different factors, but one of them he pointed out was the availability of su suitable power sources. Um, he comments that greater China markets still are looking very attractive and there's lots of reasons for optimism looking ahead. So with that, huge thanks to our Capital Markets colleagues, Francis, Wayne and Gordon for their expert opinion. Thank you to Catherine for her excellent moderation of our panel discussion. Um, as always, please drop Catherine, myself or any of our Greater China Regional Research Heads, as you can see on the screen, uh, drop us an email if you wish to subscribe for our Asia Pacific Investor and Developer newsfeed, quarterly market speeds for over 30 cities in Greater China or any other Cushman and Wakefield Thought Leadership publications. We will be back next month for our Asia Pacific Capital Markets webinar featuring a spotlight on supply chain management. Thank you very much for listening in. Keep in contact and we look forward to engaging with you again soon. Have a great day ahead. Goodbye. <laughs>